But tonight we have uh, Justin, who's going to turn on his video and unmute his talk for us. Uh, he is a Garden Red local. He is the very fresh age of 18, but he's grown up on the Garden Red and has extensive experience in this area and birds in this area probably more than anyone else at this point. He's currently uh, battling through his matric preparation. So I really am appreciative of the fact that he took the time to put this presentation together. He has pre-recorded his talk for, uh, for us tonight, but he is joining us for some live questions afterwards and just to say hi in the intros as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, Justin was a Owlet Award winner um, with Bird Life South Africa just last year, along with his good mate, Mark Hastick for his involvement in birding and conservation as a, a youth ambassador for our birds. So Justin, it's great to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us, putting in the time and preparing this presentation. And while I'm getting it loaded up on my side, you are very welcome just to say hi to everyone uh, before we kick off. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Yo, I'm, ex I'm excited to be here tonight. <laughs> oh no, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed birding in the garden route my, my entire life. It's it's fueled my passion into birding and it is, it's brought me where I am today. The birds here are incredibly exciting, so I'm excited to be sharing a bit about my, my favorite areas with you guys. Awesome, Justin. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. I know you've been struggling with your Wi-Fi on that side as well, so I'm glad that it seems to be holding. And I'm sure there'll be some questions for you afterwards. But in, uh, in the interim, we're going to play your pre-recorded presentation. Um, and we'll kick that off. Um, if you can just stay on and tell me that you can see this okay. Fantastic, yo, I can see it perfectly now. All right, thanks everyone for joining us and let's kick off Justin's presentation on forests and fanbos, birds and birding in Lysland, Little Big Bay. Good evening, folks. I hope everybody is doing fantastic on this wonderful Tuesday evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Justin Ponder. I am a young avid birder from the garden route of the Western Cape. I've grown up and spent my entire life in the garden route, and this is the area that has fueled my passion into birding and it's brought me up to where I am today. So I'm going to be chatting about some of my favorite spots in the key areas of Neisner and Plettenberg Bay. So first off, Thank you for everybody for joining. I am not very experienced with technology, so this probably won't be very smooth, but I, I do hope to get the point across to you. So let's associate ourselves with whereabout we're talking here. At the bottom of the page, highlighted in red, is the garden route. You can see we're right on the eastern part of the Western Cape. And this area, it abounds with very interesting habitats that aren't found in very many places around the province. So the garden route itself stretches from Riversdale on the left hand side of the page here, all the way along the coast through Mossel Bay, George, Sedgefield, Neisner, all the way up to Plettenberg Bay, ending right where the Western Cape ends there on that red line. So I've split this presentation up into two parts to make it a little bit simple. And we're going to be starting off with Neisner. Now, Neisner is quite often known as a holiday destination. However, the birding here is, is very easy, as the habitats are pretty much right in town most of the time. So the key habitats we're going to be looking at in Neisner are going to be the Afromontane Forest, Estuary, Coastal Forest, sorry, Coastal Fainbos, and the Ocean. So all of these habitats are very easily within reach from Neisner and you don't have to travel more than about 20 minutes to access them. So this photo over here shows a fishing boat going out towards the Neisner heads out on a pelagic, which I'll get to soon. So starting off, we're going to be looking at circles in the forest or Jubilee Creek. So for every site, I've added coordinates at the top here, right next to the name. So that if you were to, if you want to find the spot, you can simply either take a photo of the coordinates or look back on the recording of this presentation and get them from there. So the circles in the forest is a sand parks land that is a very, very interesting patch of Afromontane forest. 
it is sand parkland obviously so there is a small fee payable at the at the entrance gate but it's it's completely worth it there are multiple trails at this site of varying lengths so if you want to take a nice long hike you're welcome to or if you want to just go on a short little walk with the family that's also an option there's a couple of picnic sites and ablution facilities as well so it makes it a very very good spot for a family trip so this spot as i said is predominantly afromontane forest it's very very tall and very very developed forest so there are a lot of interesting species that are found in it species such as white starred robin marina trogan Grey cuckoo shrike and scaly throated honey guide can be found in several spots along the along the circles in the forest trails. It is, however, a good idea to to keep an eye on your sky, because birds like crowned eagle, African cuckoo hawk, and forest buzzard, which is pictured here, can be seen flying over at any time. So there aren't really any distinct spots along these trails for birds. So it is quite a good idea to get to know your microhabitats. And in the forest, you're going to be looking at two distinct microhabitats, which is going to be the tall open canopy forest and the dense forest. So these two uh, microhabitats hold very different birds. If you're looking in the tall open canopy forest, you're going to be looking at birds such as Narina trogan and gray cuckoo shrike. However, in the more dense forest, you're going to be looking at birds like white star robin. The next site we're going to be looking at is one of my favorite sites in Neisner, which is Woodbourne Pan. Once again, I've added the coordinates on the site here, so you can easily get to the site when you want to. So this site is, it's got no facilities. It's in the middle of town and the birding is pretty much only roadside birding. So you can either park your car close by and walk, or you can just take a slow drive past and gaze from your window. It's right in the middle of town, as I've mentioned, so you're pretty much right close to, to shops and fuel stations, and you don't have to travel more than five kilometers to get to either of these. So this, this site is predominantly estuary, although there is a small patch of coastal forest that surrounds the estuary. This is a wader hotspot, so you're going to be looking for birds such as marsh sandpiper, ruff, common green shank, and pied avocet. If you're lucky, you might also get a flyover of osprey. As I mentioned, there is a coastal forest right around the edges of the pan, and this forest, you can be looking for birds like olive bushrike and Nisen warbler. It is a way to hotspot, and it has delivered many, many rarities in the past. Rarities such as lesser yellowlegs, common red shank, and pectoral sandpiper have all pitched up in the past, and it is always a good idea to look out for these when you're around the pan. Moving on to our next site, we're going to be looking at Brenton and Belvedere. So this site isn't actually in Neisner itself, but it is right across the estuary from Neisner. So I've included it in the presentation. To get to the site, you simply have to go around along the, the white bridge, along the N2, and then turn into the Brenton and Belvedere area. This is mostly a tourist area. So there are lots of viewpoints, guest houses, there aren't any big shops, but there are a few small convenience stores and restaurants around the area. There are no fuel stations here, though, so if you were to visit, you must just be aware of that. The habitats we're looking at here are going to be mostly coastal fanbores, although there is a decent patch of coastal forest and there are access points to the Nisen Lagoon. So that always delivers some, some interesting birds. I've split it up into the different habitats and which birds you're going to be finding in which habitats. We'll start by looking at the coastal fanbores. The coastal fanbores is not as distinct as the fanbores of the mountains. So you're not going to be having your Cape Rock jumpers and ground woodpeckers. However, you are going to be looking for birds like Karuprinia, Southern Chagra, 
and great stubble collared sunbird. Next, the coastal forest, we're going to be looking for birds such as olive bushrike, blue mantle crested flycatcher, and nice and woodpecker. At night, you could also have a chance of finding birds like African wood owl. The access point into the Nisner Lagoon doesn't have great views over the actual estuary, so you shouldn't expect too many waders, but you can look for birds such as Pied Kingfisher, Cape Cormorant, and Water Thickney roosting on the banks. Out of interest, there's also a lone ground scraper thrush that has been hanging around this area for, I think it's almost two years now. This is quite a mega bird for the Western Cape, and it's only the second record for the Western Cape as far as I am aware. So it's definitely a bird to, to be on the lookout for. So since there aren't any, since I've split it up into habitats, I'm going to be looking at the best places to access these habitats. Starting with A, we've got Coastal Fainboss. Now the coastal Fainboss access points are just two viewpoints along the side of the road where it is safe to stop. That you can see over here by A is the first one. The second one is over here. So there is a view over the over the ocean at the second point, but it is a bit distant, so you can't really expect any any seabirds from here. Next at B we've got coastal milkwood forest. This is down in the village of Brenton itself, and just taking a short drive around the town could possibly yield all your, your forest birds. Next we have C, the Neisner River, and that is simply a jetty on the edge of Brenton where you can park your car and take a look for some of your water birds. Lastly, we have D, which is the ground scraper thrush. So there are two distinct points where most of the reports come from, but anywhere in the Brenton and Belvedere area, you could have a possibility of bumping into it. But the two best spots are going to be here in the village of Belvedere, and then here by Villa Castelloni. Moving on, we're going to take a look at Nisner Heads. So Nisner Head is once again quite a famous tourist spot and it is more geared towards tourists however the birding is quite decent here the facilities here include several boardwalks and trails there's a couple of viewpoints and then close by you'll have shops restaurants and bathrooms as i said it is more geared towards tourists and it might be a bit busy for birding but earlier in the morning, you could have a chance of bumping into some good, decent birds. So the habitats we're looking at here is going to be fantastic views over the ocean, good coastal forest, and then it is right up on the mountain, so you have good access to cliffs. Birds such as olive bushrike and Nisner warbler can be found in the coastal forest. The coastal forest is basically just small patches of, of forest as you walk down towards the viewpoints. Along the cliffs, there is a resident peregrine falcon. So if you are in the area, it is always a good idea to either scan the big trees, the cliffs, or just watch out for this bird flying around. The good views on the ocean do make it a very good space for, for sea watching. So if you come here on a windy day, you could have chances of birds such as white and petrel and other pelagics. However, on a normal day, just scanning the rocks, you could have Cape Cormorant and other general water birds. Now, this site isn't exactly a public site, but I thought I would add it anyway because the birding here can be very good, especially in the winter when the bird numbers are at their highest. We're going to be looking at the Nisner Pelagics. So these trips aren't scheduled trips. They go out simply on demand and when somebody wants to organize a trip. The trips are about three or four hours long. They go out to about 20 kilometers out of Nisner. If you're lucky and you go in the winter, you might have a chance of finding a fishing trawler, which is like this scene over here. The bird numbers aren't as high as you would have in Cape Town or out on the, out on the Cape Pelagics, 
but you could still have some decent numbers of birds. The birding is, as I said, it's not as great as Cape Town, but it does still bring in some good birds, such as Shy Albatross, which is pictured here, Black Brown Albatross, and Indian Yellownose Albatross. Birds such as Cory Shearwater, Great Shearwater, Wilson's and European Storm Petrel are also possible, and we regularly see these on the pelagics. And some of the specials include a possibility of flesh footed shearwater. So, again, this isn't a guaranteed species, but it is definitely something to be aware of and look out for if you were to go on one of these pelagics, as they have picked up and they have been picked up in the past. Sabine's gull is also a possibility in the summer, so it's yeah, you, know, you have to really choose which, which season you go into. Lastly, for Nisna, we're going to be looking at the Nisna estuary. So the Nisna estuary is very, very easy to access in several spots around Nisna, as the whole town pretty much wraps around it. There aren't any distinct sites, but I'm going to be mentioning a few of my favorite spots to look over onto the estuary. Since it is in the middle of town or around town, there are lots of shops, restaurants, fuel stations, and accommodations which you can pretty much be easily accessed to as you go around town. So here we've got a few common wimbrels, which is photographed by Luke Allen, and we're going to be looking at some of the birds that can be seen here on the estuary. Birds such as grey plover in their hundreds can be seen, and it's quite a spectacle to have them in summer. Birds such as Wimbrel, Curlew Sandpiper, and Western Osprey have also been seen on the estuary. And Eurasian Curlew is also a possibility, however this is a lot more uncommon and it is definitely not a guaranteed sighting. So I've made a bit of a chart here to show my, my favorite spots to, to look over onto the Nisna estuary. Starting off at A, we've got a spot that's just off the, the N2, just on the, the eastern side or the western side of Nisna. So this spot is a bit of a fishing jetty and it is somewhat quiet, although there will be a couple of fishermen around if you do go there. The views onto the mudflats are a little bit distant, but it is possible to get a good view without a scope, although a scope is definitely, it'll definitely help. Moving on to B, we've got another bit of a fishing jetty. And this is quite a busy spot, so the, the views onto the estuary aren't as great, and the waders numbers aren't as high, but you do still have a good possibility to see some, some good birds. Next, at C, we've got the bridge over to Tees and Island. So again, this is a very busy spot, and often you'll have fishermen walking along the, the mudflats, therefore making it a lot harder to see your waders. However, it is possible to get lucky in the morning with some waders, otherwise during, during a normal day you'll possibly see some good birds like... Uh, uh, sorry, I had a bit of a brain freeze here. You could get some good birds such as the spoonbills, aigrettes, and the, uh, the oyster catchers. Next, we'll move on to D, which is along the road to the Woodbourne Pan, actually, and the Nisen Heads. So it's a good, a good spot to stop along your way to some other birding sites. Here is a little less busy, although the number of waders are still not as high. You still have a good chance of seeing stuff like Wimbrel, Grey Plover, and Curly Sandpipers. Lastly, on the other side of the, the, the river, we've got E, which is a bit noisy because it is right next to the N2, but you do have some good views onto the mudflats and a good chance of seeing waders such as marsh sandpiper, common sandpiper, and curly sandpiper. This is also one of the best spots to look for Eurasian curlew. Okay, so that brings up our part one, and we're moving on to part two, which is Plettenberg Bay. So Plattenburg Bay is also a tourist town, however, in my, in my opinion, the birding here is a lot better than Eisner. It has got a lot more specials, and the habitats in town are 
a lot more diverse than Neisner. Out of interest, Plettenberg Bay also holds the highest number for a single atlas card in the Western Cape, which was set by Peter Faster in, I think it was December last year. So it definitely shows that this, this area is one of the most diverse areas in the Western Cape. The habitats that we're going to be looking at in Plettenberg Bay include the tidal lagoon and estuary, which are very much linked together, Afromontane forest, grassland, fynbos, ocean, and then forested river. So this photo over here shows the Kierbohm's river mouth, which was a photo taken by Bruce Ward Smith. The first site is something that a lot of you probably have heard about or visited, so I'll cover it pretty quickly. We're going to be taking a look at Roburg. So Roburg is on the western side of Plettenberg Bay, and it is basically a large piece of land that juts out into the ocean, making it quite an interesting spot. The facilities here include bathrooms, there's a couple of trails around to take, and there are picnic facilities as well. So this is also, it's Cape Nature Land, so there is a small fee payable on entrance, unless you don't have a wild card. And it is, it is completely worth it, since the birding here is just phenomenal. Something to be aware of, though, if you're visiting here with family, is that it, a lot of the trails do go along the edge of the cliffs. And during windy days, that can be a bit dangerous with small kids. So the habitats here are pretty much only fainbors and ocean. But there are a couple of patches of almost thicket, but not quite. So the birding for those habitats aren't really worth mentioning. So the fainbors species are quite a lot different to the coastal fainbors species mentioned a bit earlier. You'll be looking for birds such as orange breasted sunbird, ground woodpecker, Caruprinia, Redneck Spurfowl, Southern Chagra, and Cape Bunting along any of the trails here. Also, as I like to say, keep your eyes above because Rock Kestrel and Alpine Swift could be seen flying over. Along the beaches, you can keep your eyes out for African oyster catchers, as this is quite a good area to see them, especially along the rocks below the main building. Windy days are also quite, quite productive here, as seabirds such as shy albatross can be seen flying quite close to the rocks. On a general day though, you can expect birds like Cape Gannet. Moving on to our next site, we'll take a look at Goose Marsh. So this is a name that a lot of you will probably know, as there has been a recent rarity that's been hanging around this area. You can see I've got the coordinates here again as the as the main site. Now I've added this as pretty much the entire of the the, the Kierbohm's estuary, since this is the best spot to access it. However, if you have a kayak or another boat, it is worthwhile exploring the rest of the estuary. So on site here, there aren't any facilities. However, within a kilometer or two, there are shops, restaurants, and fuel stations. So it is an easily accessible site. The site is best visited at low tide when the mud banks are exposed. So birds such as bar-tailed godwit, ruddy turnstone, curly sandpiper, common ring plover and grey plover can be seen on any general summer day. During the, the sorry, that, yeah, that's the waders are best seen during summer. You've also got two resident raptors, the one being partially migratory, but also partially resident. So any of the trees or mud banks you can scan for African fish eagle and Western osprey. So the, the residents or the possibly now resident rarity is the Eurasian oyster catcher, which I've pictured here. Now this bird has been hanging around for several months now. So it's leading us to believe that, as I said, it could possibly be becoming a resident. So this bird has been hanging around Goose Marsh and Kierbohm's estuary since about December 2022 or 2021. And although it isn't best seen from Goose Marsh, it is possible to see from Goose Marsh. 
It is more regularly seen, however, on the other side of Goose Marsh, in front of the, the, there's a bit of a housing estate there. So it is definitely a bird to, to keep your eyes open for when you're in the area. Let's take a look at one of my favorite birding sites in Plet, the Kierbooms River. So I've added now two location points here, since there are two places where you can rent boats to go up the river. So this site, you have to unfortunately rent a boat or bring your own boat to, to get to the best spots. But it is very, very worthwhile as the habitats and birding up the river are simply astonishing. So along either side of the river at my two location points, you can have, you can find accommodation, bathrooms, picnic facilities, and quite often boat hire. So the two habitats here are going to be forested river and Afromontane forest. Now on the, on the western side of the river, there's a camping site, which is in the Afromontane forest. So it is definitely something to be visual aware of when you're choosing a site to go to. The birds here are incredibly special and kayaking or boating up the river, you could find half collared kingfisher, African finfoot, or even white black night heron, which I've pictured here. There are a few trails as well along the side of the river further, further up river where you can actually stop your boat and then go out to hike. And in these forests, you can find birds such as Nerina trogon and Grey Kukushrike. It is also incredible for, for raptors in this along this river as you've got mountains rising up on either side. So you can look out for birds such as crowned eagle and other raptors. Moving on to the next site, this is one of the, the, local, the local specials, White Horse Dam. Now on this site, there are no facilities. It is it's just simply roadside birding, but there are shops, fuel stations, and accommodation close by. So this spot is along a quiet dirt road, so it is best to be vigilant when you're at the spot. However, it is an incredible spot for an evening of birding because the light here is simply astonishing, especially in the evening. However, the morning can also be quite productive, especially in summer. So the habitats here we're looking at are going to be a reeded pond, which is Whitehorse Dam itself, an extensive reed bed along the way to, to Whitehorse Dam. There's also a bit of thicket next to the, the Whitehorse Dam, which is somewhat good for birding. So along the way, in, in the, reeded, the, the reed beds, you have a good chance of hearing or possibly even seeing African rail and red-chested flufftail, which are somewhat simple to, to hear, although seeing them is, is quite a different story. At Whitehorse Dam itself, there are often a couple of African snipes hanging around, but there's also a couple of Malachite kingfishers, which are quite easy to see. Black Craig is also a possibility anywhere along the reeded beds or along the, the Whitehorse Dam itself. Now summertime is quite productive at the site as the swallows and martins roost on the, or not, not roost, they, they sit on the, the, the telephone lines around the reed beds before flying off in the mornings. And on a, on a good morning, you could have a possibility of finding sand, banded and common house martins sitting together on the telephone lines. It is honestly quite a spectacle to see in summer. The thicket around the pond also holds some interesting birds, such as black-bellied starling, which I saw there quite recently. Moving on to another one of my favorite sites, which is the uplands. So this site is just outside of Plaid, but the, the birding is, is simply astonishing as well. The coordinates I've added here are for the turn off to the main road of the uplands, although anywhere along the road to this, these coordinates are, are good for birding as well. There are no facilities on this site. It is also just roadside birding. So it's something to be aware of if you're planning a trip to here. 
So this one is grassland almost in, entirely, but there are patches of Afro-Montane forest. So once again, I've split it up into the different habitats and the birds you can look for in those habitats. Starting off with grassland, this area is incredible for cysticulars. Birds such as wing snapping, cloud, and wailing cysticular can be found in this general area. It is an, it's also a good idea to get to know your different microhabitats, as the wing snapping cloud and wailing cysticular are generally not found in the same area. Summertime is also very, very good for this spot, since Amma falcon and European roller can be found roosting or sitting on the telephone lines during most parts of the day. In patches of long grass, you can also look out for denims busted, which are quite common in this area. So there's a small patch of Afromontane forest along the Uplands Road, which although it isn't as developed as some of the other forest patches we've looked at, it does hold some, some decent birds. So and a bit of an advice for this spot is that the road is quite curvy, so it is a good idea to park a little bit before the forest patch and then walk down into the, into the forest. In the forest itself, you can look for birds such as blue-mantled crested flycatcher, white-starred robin, nice taraco, and yellow-throated woodland warbler. It's also a good idea to get to know your forest calls, as to see birds in the forest is quite a lot harder than actually just hearing them. So the uplands is a very interesting area since it sits right on the eastern part of the Western Cape, We're only a few kilometers away from the Eastern Cape itself. And therefore, some of the Eastern Cape birds sometimes extend into the area. So this area has produced birds such as golden-breasted bunting, yellow-throated petronia or bush sparrow, and white browed scrub robin in the quite recent past. Spotted flycatcher, although it isn't a distinct Western Cape rarity, it is also a bird to look out for in this area. Moving on to what we can see is a bit of a chart as to the different spots to, to look for these birds. Starting off with A, it's not a distinct site, but it is a good spot to look out for denims busted. The grass here is quite long, so I always enjoy stopping here and taking a bit of a scan. At B, we've got the Uplands Road turnoff. This is also quite a good spot for birding, as I often have the Amma falcons and European rollers at this spot in summer. The grass here is also sometimes quite long, and I've seen denims busted here before. Lastly, we've got C, which is the patch of Afromontane Forest. As you can see, the road is a little bit curvy, so I advise you to stop a little bit beforehand and then walk down into the forest. Quite interestingly, the spot before the forest is a very, very good spot for whaling cesticular. So you definitely be on the lookout for those while you're in the area. Lastly, or second lastly for plet, we're going to be taking a look at Bitoflay. It's another name that you might be aware of since this spot has produced a good amount of rarities in the past. So this site doesn't have a lot of distinct facilities, but you've got a bird hide, which is very, very helpful for photographers. And it is quite close to a bunch of shops or fuel stations. However, there have been problems in the past with people accessing this site without permission. So on the, at, at the coordinates, there's a bit of a sign which you can see here which there's a phone number on it and you can just phone the phone number and ask for permission to access the site. There is a small fee payable, but the birding here is incredible and I would definitely recommend visiting the site. So this site is mudflats and reeds, and therefore you're going to be looking at water birds and waders. Some of the waders that you can look out for here are rough, wood sandpiper, kitlitz's plover, and African snipe. Now the African snipe here are actually in incredible numbers and I've seen up groups of up to about 30 birds on the on the mudflats at once. Scanning along the edge of the reeds is also quite quite productive as you can see birds such as African rail and little bitten. In the reeds itself you could possibly find African swamp hen. 
there's a lot of ducks and tills on the on the pan itself so definitely be a lookout for anything unusual but more regularly you can possibly find south african shelter another highlight of the site is that there is a pair of blue cranes that breed along the along the valley here so anytime in the evenings or mornings or during the middle of the day you could possibly have a fly over of this pair of blue cranes also i thought i'd mention this site has produced rarities in the past and quite recently there was a group of at least four or five pectoral sandpipers that were seen on the mudflats so always be aware of rarities when visiting the site and lastly although this isn't in plate itself i thought i would mention the site since it is possibly some of the best forest birding in the western cape i'll be taking a look at nature's valley so this is a day trip from Plettenberg Bay. It's about half an hour away. But as I've mentioned, the birding is, is unrivaled. You can't get anywhere close to Nature's Valley anywhere else in the Western Cape. There are, in the, in the town of Nature's Valley itself, there are a few shops, restaurants, and accommodation. However, there are no fuel stations in the valley itself. So it is also good to be aware of this before visiting the site. There are a number of trails and picnic sites scattered around the area as well, so it is quite a good spot for a family day trip. So the birding here is, I'll split it up again into to habitats. We'll be looking at forest, forested rivers, fainbos, ocean and estuary. So all of this can be found in the town of Nature's Valley itself making it quite a good spot for atlasing with all the species in one area. Firstly, we'll take a look at forest and the Croat River, which is the main river in the Nature's Valley area. So on the bridge itself for the Croat River, you can look for birds such as African finfort and half collar kingfisher if you're lucky. Right next to the Croat River, there's also a good few trails where you can find birds such as Narina trogan, scaly throated honey guide, Grey Cuckoo Shrike, Lemon Dove, White Star Robin, and Forest Canary. As I like to say, keep your eyes up, as African Cuckoo Hawk and Crowned Eagle could possibly give you a, a flyover. So the Fainbos here is also incredible, since there's, there's a good patch of Fainbos right above the, the town. Birds such as Cape Sugarbird, Cape Siskin, Orange Breasted Sunbird, and Victorin's warbler can be found with relative ease, although seeing some of these are a lot harder, as some of you might know. There's also a couple of spots for lazy sesicula along the, along the area, which is another quite a, quite a special bird for the Western Cape. There's a very limited spots to find them around the area. So once again, I've made a bit of a chart here for, for all the spots you can access the best habitats and starting with a we're going to be looking at the forest and croat river now this can be accessed through many sites all around nature's valley but this is possibly my favorite or possibly the best so this spot is right next to the croat river and you can park in the little parking lot right by the trail and either walk into the trail itself or along to the croat river at b we have got the river mouth so this spot is a good spot to to come with the family since the the kids can simply play on the sand while you walk along the bank of the river looking for for waders moving on to see we have our fane boss so this is an access point to a couple of the trails although most of the trails start in nature's valley itself this is where the trails cross the road and it is good spots to get into the fane boss quite easily Lastly, we'll take a look at D, which is simply the beach access, where you can find different birds such as oyster catchers and possibly seabirds if you're lucky enough. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much to everybody for watching.
I do hope I managed to, to teach you a bit about the birds of the Western Cape. It is an incredible area and I am simply so blessed to have grown up in this area. So if you do want to get into touch with me, I have put in my email address, my Instagram and my iNaturalist where I do take private messages from anybody. So yeah, if you have any questions, please, please ask them. Right, so as uh, I'm pulling up my slides here, just to echo what uh, Justin just said, if you do have any questions, Please do pop them in the Q&A for us. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, you can pop them in the comments. But I think uh, it just is necessary for me to, to say how very impressed I am with this young man who's made a name for himself over a couple of years in the garden route. Um, and I think having, having done this in amongst your preparations for the trick mock exams is just incredible. Um, I don't think I could ever pulled off anything quite that impressive uh, in my matric year. So I hope that you're getting uh, full marks for all your, your English orals at school because <laughs> clearly you're an incredible presenter and very, very knowledgeable about your area and the birds and the various spots as well. So Justin, if you are still with us, if your Wi-Fi is held, um, please do just unmute yourself and, and turn on your video just for a couple of questions. Um, we do have just one or two at the moment. Justin does have load shedding uh, any moment. Awesome. Well, thank you to everybody for, for watching. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Justin. So we won't go on too long because I do know that you are going to be cut off eventually. Um, so there is a question from Penny Abbott uh, asking about that big Nisner fire that happened a few years ago. And in, in your sort of time spent in the garden route, have the surroundings recovered? Um, what have been some of the effects of that big fire? Yeah, so the garden route has actually recovered incredibly from, from those big Nisner fires. The tourism is pretty much back to full blast at the moment and all the damage has pretty much been rebuilt. Most of the vegetation has also grown back, so it's, it's really been incredible to see the, the rebound after these fires. Cool. So the area is mostly recovered. That's that's very good news. All right. Uh, there's a question, like another one from Penny, uh, which I'll field, and she's asked about how, how to find out. Well, firstly, um, Justin, how does one find out about pelagic trips out of Nisner? So the pelagic trips are currently organised by Tim Carr, who's a local guide in this area. So if you would like to get into touch with him, you're welcome to pop me an email and I will put you into contact with the correct people. Cool, there we go. Simple as that, Penny. And uh, your follow-up question was, is there a pelagic uh, plan for the time of the May AGM um, next year at Block to Wilderness? And I've been WhatsApping furiously behind the scenes to my colleagues who are on the organizing committee. And they've said that there is a plan for one. So. Keep your eyes out for, for the various programs and schedules that are sent out and make sure that you get yourself on one of these pelagics off the garden route that can be really, really good and turn up some really nice birds as well. Justin, how many pelagics have you managed to do uh, out of Nisna so far? Out of Nisna, I've been lucky enough to be out on three pelagics. So I've, I've got a bit of experience out on these Nisna oceans. And have you managed to see the flesh-footed shearwater? Unfortunately not. It has eluded me every time. <laughs> That's, um, I've, I've guided over 40 pelagics out of Cape Town and I'm still to see one, so um, don't feel too bad. <laughs> um, definitely a very tough species to come by in the, in the Western Cape. Absolutely. Um, there was another question from Alimutu who wants to know, um, are there any public transport options in this area or is it advisable to have your own transport? So at the George Airport, there are a couple of car rentals, but I'm sure during this AGM, there will be a few buses and tours going out to the various areas. That's exactly right. So we will have some excursions with the 
with the AGM, but um, with, with uh, any of your own trips, I do think it's advisable to have your own transport. But as, as Justin, you said as well, you know, all of these places are within very close reach of both Nice and Plex, apart from maybe Nature's Valley, which is a bit of a further trip. But there's the wonderful thing is there's great birding in and around town, so you really don't have to travel too far. Um, there's another question here from Gordon Holtman who wants to know about timing your pelagics in Neisner. Um, is it worthwhile doing a pelagic in October? What is the the best time of year to be doing pelagics out of out of the garden route? So it definitely depends on what your species targets are. In summertime, you could be getting a lot of the summer migrants, such as great shearwater and Sabine's gull. Whereas in winter, you could be getting species such as black bowed black sorry, black bowed albatross. So it's definitely depending on what your target range is. In the winter, though, we do often find the trawlers. So bird numbers are generally a lot higher. Okay, okay. So if you're chasing specific species, take note of which seasons they're around. And if you're looking for that spectacle, maybe head out in winter. Um, all right, there's another question here. Not about wild birds in the area, but obviously being bird lovers, we, we like to see all different types of birds. And of course, there is birds of Eden in Pettenberg Bay, and they do some uh, rehabilitation work as well as has some exotic species. And there's just a question about what's on offer there, Justin. I don't know if you spent any time at Birds of Eden, if you have anything to say about that. Sure. So Birds of Eden, I haven't visited in a couple of years, but from what I remember, there is, is quite a few decent species there. I know they've got a lot of different parrots, including rehabilitated cape parrots that are in their massive aviary there. Other than that, there's a wealth of other indigenous and non-indigenous birds that can be seen there, such as double tooth barbet, there's uh, mandarin ducks, meave starlings. So there's a lot, of, a lot of interesting things there. Definitely worth a trip. Very interesting. Okay, thanks for sharing that with us. So I don't see any other questions, uh, but there are a whole lot of very grateful messages in the chat, which you're very welcome to just have a go through. If you are still watching and want to let Justin know what you thought of his presentation, there is our post webinar survey as well. Uh, but do pop him a message in the chat and just um, thank him for his time and his efforts. Um, he's done an incredible job. So yeah, Justin, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to Coming down to the garden route again, you've definitely upped my appetite, uh, although I never need an excuse. It's just such a phenomenal area for birding. Uh, and yeah, I look forward to spending some time with you in May next year at Flock to the Wilderness. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. It's been an honor to, to present to all of you.